Good morning. Thank you all for joining us for the Southeast Perinatal Mental Health webinar. Um, we've got a really, really exciting agenda today. Um, our focus day is on health inequalities um, and featuring two of the big projects that we've been working on this year as part of our health equalities strategy for perinatal mental health and linking in with our colleagues in maternity. So um, just briefly to go through housekeeping, um, hopefully you've seen that on the countdown clock, um, but please can you keep your lines on mute and turn off your videos um, until you're asking questions or entering into the discussion. Obviously, please raise your hand if you want to ask a question and please feel free um, to give feedback in the chat function. Um, as always, we really like it to be as interactive as possible within the chat function. So please do put your comments and reflections. And just to remind everybody, we are recording today so that colleagues that aren't able to join us can catch up and watch it at a later stage. Thank you. So our agenda today. So I will kick off with um, a bit of a national update. Um, and then that will be followed by Jenny, who will also give a national update and some of the resources. Um, then we are really, really privileged to be joined by Sue Bickler today um, from Wessex Voices, who has been working on the opening the door project for us. Um, and she will be feeding back with regards to the findings of that project. And then following Sue, we will then be having the launch of our film, The Bias Trap, A Way Forward. Um, it's a 30 minute film that we will be sharing. And I guess um, my ask of everybody today, I'm, I'm going to do a Giles Beresford, the National Clinical Advisor for Perinatal Mental Health. He says, if we can all just try, I know it's really difficult in um, the busy world that we're in, not to be doing emails and other things whilst being um, in the webinar. But if it's at all possible to just kind of switch off your devices, switch off your emails in order to just have this dedicated time today to enjoy the speakers and the film, that would be fantastic. And we would um, welcome the opportunity to hear feedback from yourselves regarding the film um, at the end of it. OK, so without further ado, I'd like to start off with a bit of a kickoff in terms of saying a really, really massive thank you to Barbara Goss, our colleague in the regional team. So Barbara is sadly leaving us to go on to Pastures New. Um, and although Barbara doesn't very often sort of front the webinars and that, she is always in the background supporting Jenny and myself and Yvette in, within the team. And just a massive, massive thank you for all the hard work that she's done um, with this over the last period of 18 months, two years. And also, Barbara has been absolutely instrumental in the work around health inequalities on our health equality strategy. So it's quite fitting that on her last webinar, that's our uh, focus for today. So thank you, Barbara. You will be really sadly missed by us all. So national update, a couple of reminders to start off with. So um, service leads will have had an email directly from me regarding this, but there is a national workshop for the mother and baby units and community services um, next Friday, a week on Friday on the 26th of November, 10 till 1. The national team are requesting two representatives from the mother and baby units and then two representatives from the community teams to attend the event. Um, the link is included on the slide here and you will have also had it separately in the invitation that I've sent out. But just a reminder that deadline for registering is this Friday. So if you haven't already registered two representatives from your service, please can you do so by this Friday? Thank you very much. So also just an update on training. So the I'm Fine training, um, which we are lucky enough to have Jules McCoy um, deliver for us. The next available date is Monday the 17th of January and there are the last remaining spaces available. So not many, but there are a couple of spaces still available. So really just to highlight that to everybody and to say um, if you want to register for a place, please can you email Jules directly. Um, it's really important that you include the following details, so your name, 
the trust you work for and confirming your role as a maternity support worker. It's specifically focused around maternity support workers and also to provide line management details in order for them to give their um, confirmation of their approval for you to attend um, the course. But uh, it's an amazing course. We've had lots and lots of fantastic feedback about it. So um, if you want a place, get in touch with Jules. OK, so our focus of today is obviously health equalities. How do we ensure that we move away from health inequalities to equalities and actually equity? So um, a focus for us in the regional team over the last year has about has been around the development of a southeast perinatal mental health equity strategy, with our focus being to ensure that the expanding perinatal mental health services are accessible to all who need them and that no one is left behind. The aim of the strategy was to tackle the determinants of health to increase ac access, quality of service provision and safety, including cultural awareness training, co-production as a golden thread throughout our work and projects to underpin inclusion and system transformation. So two of the projects that we have worked on over the last year are those that we're showcasing today. So the project opening the door to perinatal mental health services, which was done by Wessex Voices on our behalf and Sue will be presenting later, and also the film, The Bias Trap, A Way Forward, um, with more of a maternity focus in response to the Embrace findings. So as well as those projects and other projects that we've been working on as a regional team, we've also very much looked to how can we increase training and education um, addressing health inequalities. And so um, some of you will have already been attended some of our courses that we've put on, but we've got quite um, a focus around um, cultural bias, um, also um, looking at kind of different groups, so um, Gypsy and Traveller um, awareness, and various other things that are available on the Perinatal Men's Health Academy and further details of the courses that we're doing going forward will be made available on the webinars. So this is part of a whole package of work that we have pulled together in order to address health inequalities across the South East. And as you will know, much of our training and education is for the, for the full pathway for anybody who interfaces with perinatal mental health. So also education and training for midwives, um, maternity staff, um, paramedics, uh, health visitors, as, as wide as we can. So um, really important that we take a pathway approach to this. OK, so I just wanted to uh, share a slide from the national team um, in terms of increasing access by reducing health inequalities and thinking about as we develop our perinatal mental health services, reaching the women from groups who are currently underrepresented. So we know as we expand our services, it's not necessarily about seeing more of the same women. In fact, it absolutely isn't. It's about reaching out to other cohorts of women that maybe our services previously haven't seen um, or are not regularly coming through the door. So thinking about women from ethnic minority backgrounds, also thinking about our younger mums. Um, so there's 45% perinatal mental health needs in the 16 to 25 year olds. Thinking about women that are living in deprived areas, um, women in the criminal justice system or prison estate. And previously in our webinar series, we've been lucky enough to have talks um, from colleagues that are working in those areas. Also thinking about migrant or trafficked women, women escaping domestic abuse, neurodivergent women, women with learning disabilities and parents from LGBTQ plus communities. And as you know, we have a regular feature on health inequalities throughout our webinars. So if you've missed any of our previous webinars, please do go to the website and have a look as there's a, a, you know, a plethora of speakers that have spoken on some of those topics in earlier webinars. OK, so it's about thinking about assertive outreach approach, co-working as well with our communities and our voluntary sectors um, and thinking about how we measure the success in order to properly reach out to all our diverse communities. 
Um, and there's various um, resources and that that are available on the collaboration platform, the national platform. And I would um, you know, really encourage people to go and have a look in that area. There's some fabulous um, resources from across the country. Some of our resources will also be going on there. So do please go and have a look. OK. So I also wanted to talk to everybody today about Core 20 plus 5. So um, this is an NHS England and an NHS Improvement um, Initiative, and they are currently seeking views on the Core 20 plus 5 approach for reducing health inequalities. So the Core 20 refers to the most deprived 20% of the population. Um, identified by the index of multiple deprivation. And then the plus five is the five key areas, clinical areas of health inequalities. And that's maternity, severe mental illness, chronic respiratory disease, early cancer diagnosis and hypertension case finding. So there's currently a survey out at the moment which closes this Friday. So just want to highlight that the link is on the slide and will be sent out to you in terms of it's aimed at health inequalities, professionals working in the NHS. Um, you know, thinking about those that have a particular interest in, in health inequalities and one would hope that we all have an interest in this. Um, and so I would encourage you to spend some time looking on the website, go to the link and please um, fill out the survey. It's really important that we progress this work and take it forward. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Jenny, who's going to go through uh, some of the resources and also um, give the latest update on Embrace. Good morning, everybody. Um, so the first um, thing that I wanted to highlight was this lovely new report um, that the Parent Infant Foundation have been involved with. Um, and the title, I think, is particularly poignant because it was a quote from one of the mums that they interviewed for the report. Um, Nobody wants to see my baby. And it's a follow on um, report um, about babies in lockdown. So that's a really important read for us all. And then the other part of this slide is a is a nice infographic by the Parent Infant Foundation about baby brain facts. And I think it's always good that we keep ourselves up to date and have some nice resources for um, the families that we work with. So I just thought I'd make you aware of that one if you haven't seen it already. Next slide, please. Um, I'm sure that I'm sort of preaching to the converted on this call to say that the Embrace report has now been published. Um, we will be trying to get a speaker from the Embrace committee to go into a bit more detail at next month's webinar. But for this month, I think it's really important that we highlighted it. Um, the messages I found quite chastening um, and quite sad to read that there hasn't been a significant amount of change in our area. And for people on the call today, I would absolutely recommend that as, as an absolute minimum, you read chapter four, which is the mental health chapter. But I think we could probably all benefit from reading the whole report. And like I say, we will go into a bit more detail with that next month. Next slide, please. Um, we've still got the key messages in terms of the, the red flags. Um, I don't think these will be of sort of news to any of you. Some of the wording I think has changed slightly, um, which is which is great because I think it's made it slightly more user friendly. Um, next slide, please. And these are the key messages for health professionals. Um, and a lot of them, as I say, are quite um, sadly familiar. So let's make sure that we um, all sort of strive to, to make the next triennium report having slightly different messages and that hopefully we would have been able to move some of this stuff on. 
Next slide, please. So before I hand over to Sue, I just wanted to highlight this. Um, so I think a lot of you will know that my stance on sort of hard to reach groups is has always been that it's more like hard to access services and that we need to have a good old look at ourselves to see what the barriers are. And we'll come on to that nicely with Sue's presentation. But I think another strand of that is not just how we engage with people, but what we actually offer once we have found them. And I just wanted to read this out to you. So this was from somebody that had survived the atrocities in Rwanda. And then I think a number of NGOs went out and different organisations and were offering counselling. And this is what that person said, being on the end of sort of a Western um, orientated counselling. They came and their practice did not involve being outside in the sun where you begin to feel better. There was no music or drumming to get your blood flowing again. There was no sense that everyone had taken the day off so that the entire community could come together to try to lift you up and bring you back to joy. There was no acknowledgement of the depression as something invasive and external that could actually be cast out again. Instead, they would take people one at a time into these dingy little rooms and have them sit around for an hour or so and talk about the bad things that had happened to them. We had to ask them to leave. And I just found that so poignant that even when we find people, we might not actually do things that are culturally sensitive and helpful. So um, this does lead me on very nicely to our first speaker today, Sue Bickler. Um, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce Sue, who I'm sure will talk far more eloquently than I can about the project that she's undertaken for us. So I think without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Sue. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, thank you. Um, and hello, everybody. And I will certainly try to speak eloquently. Uh, I also want to say that um, one of my colleagues, Sarah Peters, is on this webinar as well. And Sarah worked alongside me uh, with this project. So I'm going to have to be doing a lot of next slide, please. So next slide, please. So yeah, op opening the door um, was um, a project that I've been I've been leading for several months um, for the for the clinical delivery network. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about what the purpose of the work was. Uh, you obviously already understand how it links back into your equalities work more generally. I'll talk about the approach that we took and and also obviously what we learned but not just what we learned about perinatal mental health but also what we learned about engagement because that was um, became equally important so ne next slide uh, a short slide just to um, explain Wessex Voices um, who we are and what we do so we we were a partnership between NHS England and Improvement in this in, in Wessex and the five local health watch but now our relationship is also with the Hampshire and Isle of Wight ICS. Um, the purpose of our work is about supporting effective patient and public involvement. And sometimes we carry out um, engagement exercises, but it's predominantly about advice, guidance and training on PPI. And we have a real focus on seldom heard groups. So by bringing together the, the local health watch, we also ensure that they have a very strong voice in the developing ICS. Um, and the, the, the benefit of working um, as a collaboration with Healthwatch is that they have fantastic networks, they hear from the population uh, and it gives us a fantastic reach into communities. So we're about supporting in a, in a constructive and independent way effective engagement. Next slide please. I just wanted to start because it, effective engagement is so important to us. I just wanted to start setting out some of the some of the principles. We've developed a toolkit which you could access outside of this webinar, and there's a link on the the slides if you want to do that. Um, and in the toolkit, we set out ten principles of effective engagement, and we don't have much time, so I'm just going to highlight five. And these are principles that we 
aimed to apply, and I hope you will see we did apply through, through this exercise that we've just carried out. So first of all, really important to engage early, otherwise the engagement isn't, isn't meaningful. We really need to be open and honest about what is possible, so what can and can't be influenced. We have a real strong um, focus on health inequalities and those who are seldom heard. So we don't try to hear from people who often have their voices heard. We seek out people who, who don't have their voices heard and often have worse outcomes and less access to services. It's important not only to listen, but also to act on what's been said and also to provide feedback back to people who've, who've spent the time talking to us. Uh, we're not at that stage yet, but, but we will make sure we get to it. Um, next slide, please. So just to um, clarify what the aims of the project were, it was about understanding the barriers to accessing perinatal mental health services. So what gets in the way, finding out what would make a positive difference. So what helps? We sought the views of women who are seldom heard and who face additional barriers. That was um, really prominent for us. And the, the aim eventually will be to use that feedback in designing new services and making sure no one is excluded and that access is broadened, as uh, Liz and Jenny mentioned right at the beginning. So um, the next slide, and I, and I just want to reiterate that um, this wasn't a piece of research with a capital R. We can't tell you that, you know, 93% of women said that and 8% of women said something different. This this is insight. These were, were, were deep conversations with a relatively small number uh, that provides insight. So um, we started this piece of work during the lockdown and the pandemic had a huge influence on what we did and how we did it. There's always challenges in engagement work and the lockdown added to those. So the first question we had to ask ourselves as a, as a project team was how do we find women who don't currently use services? And the second question was how do you do what outreach during a lockdown? We, we couldn't be out there, we couldn't be in community centres, we couldn't stand on, on high streets and uh, do any face to face work. So how do you do outreach and how do you find women who, who aren't on your books? So if you just click twice, marvellous. Um, so the, the key to finding women who don't currently use services is about going through local and trusted organisations, identifying them and then asking them to support us. And in terms of not being able to do face to face through those uh, trusted organisations, we in, instead of talking to people face to face, we use the telephone and we used Zoom, as many, many people have, have done during this period, and it worked quite well. Next slide, please. So another three challenges there. How do you really, really get to understand? Um, it's quite straightforward to put a survey together and get lots of answers, but we felt that that wouldn't really be uh, deep enough. And also, given that the area was the whole of the southeast, where do you focus? And the final question, a really important question, was how do you talk about mental health? Uh, for some people, the words mental health are off-putting, and in some cultures and communities, it's a word that isn't recognised. So we had all of those challenges as well. So three clicks, please, and we'll get we'll get some pink answers. So in terms of how we get to, we got to understand, we we decided not to use a survey, and we we had conversations. We did have a prompt so that we tried to get similar kind of information from everyone. But in honesty, the conversations were different each time because they reflected uh, each woman's experiences. We decided in the end to 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 um, focus on four areas of deprivation. It's a word that I'm no longer going to use. I was recently on a webinar webinar where a new phrase was was used, which is areas of social injustice, which I feel is actually more appropriate. Um, but we use the indices of multiple deprivation to hone in on some areas where we were more likely to contact women who were who faced those additional barriers and challenges. And in terms of the language, in our publicity material for this, we use the word, you, the word well-being rather than mental health. And in the discussions, in the conversations, Sarah and I were really flexible. Mama, hello. Uh, is, are you in hospital today? Ooh. 
Can I just ask if anybody's not on mute, can they please mute themselves? <laughs> We're just about to hear a phone call. And also, can you switch your cameras off unless you're the speaker? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, sorry. How do you how do you talk about mental health? So we made sure that when we were speaking to women, we we asked them what words they would use, and we kind of reflected that back in in the conversations. But actually, I think we found um, mental health maybe not everybody's favourite word, but it was quite um, acceptable. Next slide, please. So. Um, we we have first of all had to devise our approach to to the engagement and the starting point was to find the local organizations through whom we could find women and that was a very very major task um to an extent within within wessex voices we had a lot of contacts but we also had we were working in areas that we weren't that familiar with as well we were working across the southeast in portsmouth brighton surrey and slough so we went to all the health watch in those areas we went to the local voluntary services in those areas we googled when when all else failed we googled and zoomed in got a map of surrey of them and found on the map where the where the community center was and what the local facilities were and then we put together a flyer and we sent that flyer to all the organizations that we contacted and the flyer itself wasn't that straightforward we spent a lot of time making sure that the uh, the imagery was right and that the language was right so that it would would um, talk to people when that when they saw it. We devised a social media campaign, a targeted social media campaign, which in the end we learned wasn't that helpful, but we felt it was useful to do from the beginning. And it wasn't enough to just send these flyers and explanatory emails around to, to organisations. We had to phone organisations up once, twice, three, sometimes four times to explain what the work was about, talk to them about how they could help and really find that there was a, a joint interest in the work. And, and many organisations were really keen to help because they they recognised the importance of this work. And there were two organisations, I'll, I'll talk more about them later, who were really, really helpful and their approach really worked for us. Next slide, please. So um, just to give you a basic idea of who we spoke to and where those women came from, I won't read the whole slide out, um, but they were from three, three areas from um, a range of ethnic origins and a range of circumstances, which was really helpful to us in getting that, that, rich, um, that rich voice that, that is really important in terms of understanding the barriers. Next slide. So this is just some of the headlines. Um, I'm going to talk in more detail about the findings, but just as a starter, the majority of the women had had some experience of mental health problems, some very mild, some more severe, and not all maternity related. They were comfortable talking about mental health and were interested in, supportive of the idea of talking therapies, counselling, etc. But despite that, still felt there was a huge stigma in, in revealing that you have a mental health problem in particular during pregnancy and these for, for the reasons that you're probably very familiar with the fear of judgment the fear of unwanted interventions the fear of having your baby taken away and the fear of it you having disclosed this being on your record we asked quite a lot about whether the women access community support some had some hadn't but those that had really valued it but there were many who just didn't know where to start in finding community support for themselves. And when we asked about where the first port of call would be, although GP and health visitor was mentioned many, many times, it wasn't always with 100% confidence. And that was often because of this issue of trust. Um, there'll, there'll be, I'll give you some quotes and some more explanations of why that confidence wasn't always there but the women said very much that it's really important to to be asked and to be asked properly women aren't always going to reveal what's going on they're not always going to seek out help so that importance of being asked properly of the professionals noticing and then responding really quickly 
being really crucial. And some of these things, interestingly, have already been mentioned in, in the, uh, the, the national update. So it does, it does really resonate, I feel. Next slide. So this word cloud sets out what women said to us about the words that they would use or thought could should be used in relation to mental health. Um, I'm not going to read all of them out, obviously, but they ranged from the more low key words around feeling low, fearing teary, sad, struggling to the much more extreme phrases around feeling hate towards the baby. It's destroyed my life. I feel dead inside. Those words, that are, those phrases that are really quite, quite extreme. But a, yeah, a, a whole range of different words used to describe mental health generically. Next slide. So here are some quotes that give some examples of what the women meant by mental health still being taboo, there still being a stigma. I, I, I'm not going to read out all of the quotes because uh, time is limited, but if you just have a have a quick a quick glance, what I think is quite interesting is that even though many women, they didn't really logically believe that if they said they had a mental health problem, their baby would be taken away. But somehow there's some imprint, it says in the bottom slide, the bottom quote there, it really imprinted on our minds. And that was said very many times, um, even if they didn't really believe it, they felt it was there lurking in the background. Um, and then another slide, the next slide, please. So we were really keen to understand what helps and many of the women had had some good experiences of perimental mental health services in general, um, some less so, but there were a number of things that they said had helped them or would, would have helped them or other women. And support groups came up a lot and especially with, uh, with others in a similar situation so that that's, that's level of understanding each other. The need to feel trust, to feel safe and not be judged came up numerous times. And again, this issue about being asked the right questions in the right way. This issue as well about not everyone is going to seek support, not everyone is going to reveal what's going on for them. So the importance of those around them noticing them and, and inviting them to, to, to get the support they need, be it in the community or be it through statutory services. Next slide. The, the other things that women thought would help was just making it really, really simple. Uh, and in terms of knowing the number to phone, who to get in touch with. Consistency came up a lot, which is probably not unexpected, but because to build that trust, you need to develop relationships with people. So seeing the same person was seen as really, really important. The need to have your feelings validated was was though those words weren't used. That's what the women meant. And time, it's a it's a, it's a short word, but actually there was quite a lot that sat behind that word. Um, women felt that they had to be given enough time, so long enough to talk and long enough to be able to op really open up. Time in terms of uh, being seen frequently uh, in order to build a quick connection and also being seen at the right time. There are times which are good and times that work uh, less well in terms of in terms of being able to open up and time in the sense of being seen quickly. So when you make that call, when you reach out, having a very, very quick response. And the next slide. Shows some quotes. So these are some of the things that were said about what, you know, a direct quotes that said about what would help. They exemplify the points just made in, in uh, the last slide. And I just want to draw your attention to the bottom right. That quote there was a series of questions that one, one woman suggested would be really helpful rather than the are you OK? Um, and I was interested at the beginning, you were talking about the, um, the trailing um, well, I'm fine. And I think this relates really closely to that. So she was saying, ask, how are you feeling? How are you doing today? Were the first two weeks what you expected? Have you seen anyone today? So the sort of questions that are likely to really elicit a response. And the next slide is, is a, some more um, quotes as well. And these were these were things that had 
had actually happened, it had, had happened to these women in a really, really positive way. So the first quote is from a woman who had previously had very, very um, difficult relationships with statutory services because of addiction problems. Um, but the, this worker that she spoke to, she said, was phenomenal. Sorry, I've got something weird on my slide. Yeah, the worker was phenomenal. Weekly calls, didn't judge, did not recoil at my past. It completely turned my life around. And another woman who had postnatal depression and went to the GP saying, I don't know why I'm struggling so much, other people seem to cope. And the GP validated this woman by saying, it is worse for you, you've got PND, I can tell you that. Um, and for both of those women, those behaviours, those words, literally turned their lives around. So those were both very, very positive experiences. Next slide, please. So the reverse of what helps, we asked, we asked about what are the barriers? What do you think gets in the way? Um, and a range of things were said. The first thing that I is on the list here is waiting lists. And this isn't necessarily that waiting lists are long. This is a perception that if you ask for help, you're going to have to wait, which, which puts people off. Uh, the feeling that you might be judged and the feeling internally of shame that you're not a good mother, that you're not a good parent. There were some practical issues around getting through the GP. This is the GP's reception was mentioned um, and the fear of having to explain yourself first. Competitive parenting was also mentioned again, maybe not those words, but particularly linked to the Internet and this whole feeling that everybody out there is having a great time. They're all better parents than you. They're all enjoying themselves and you're not. And a very, very strong and oft repeated um, view that services are just there for the baby. Now, you probably don't conceive that this, that is the way services are. It's probably not your experience and it's not your ex not your intention, but this is very much what, what women were saying. And if you go on to the next slide, here are some of the quotes that, that exemplify that. So, you know, when you call the GP, you have to explain how you were feeling to justify a call back to qualify for an appointment. And there's a big issue at the moment, as we all know, about GP access. And then the, the comment there about the health visitors just there for the baby. They ask how you are, but don't hang around long enough to hear the answer. So not enough time and this, this sense that services aren't there for parents. Next slide, please. Um, and some some more quotes that say very, very similar things. Um, the, the second quote there again is is from a woman who'd who'd had a very difficult past and, and felt that that her history hung around her and didn't enable her to break through and develop good relationships with with services. She felt everyone was thinking you just take drugs. You've had your kids removed. You're scum. That was her feeling. Next slide. I think we're doing OK for time. Um, a, a slide here about cultural sensitivity. So some of the women had very specific needs because of the, the cultures, communities that, that they came from. Um, one South Asian woman who mentioned that within her family, she was talking particularly about her family, they're not open to discussing mental health. The whole issue was swept under the carpet and it's very much taboo. Um, and she also said, even though she had had some very good experiences of being supported, but that her cultural needs weren't considered. Um, a black woman talked a lot about how in her family, mental health is not discussed. And if it is mentioned, the response is that you pray or you go to the pastor, you seek religious guidance. You certainly don't go talking to professionals about it. It's seen as a weakness. And another black woman talked that this was really interesting because this was when I was asking the demographic questions um, and she was very reluctant to talk at all, really, because of her mistrust about anything to do with the NHS or the state in general. Um, but she was really keen to answer the question about her ethnic origin because her feeling was that black women don't speak out enough and she wanted her voice to be heard. Next slide, please. Now, in, I, I, um, I dwell on this a bit because actually in our questions that the prompts that we had through the conversations, we didn't specifically ask about uh, prenatal preparation, but it actually came up a lot unprompted. 
and the things that were said that were that women really believed that support networks should be built up prior to having the baby and that that should that professionals should help them with that and that also those support networks should be really tailored to people who need extra support emotionally a real view that if you have extra mental health needs emotional support needs you need to be with others that really understand that there was also a real view that counsellors or talking therapies um, should be part of the conversation not from the beginning they shouldn't just be mentioned when there was a problem but they should be mentioned as a possibility in advance and i really like this quote from one woman who said that it would be really good if the message was you may come out of hospital beaming or you may not if you do feel like this this is who sh you should contact so in a sense it's just normalizing it and preparing women for things that might happen and make it really easy to get that support when it's needed so um next slide we're on to what we learned overall, and I'm going to start with uh, what we learned about engagement, reminding everybody about um, the principles that I meant, talked about right at the beginning. Um, it's really important to invest time and be persistent. And in all honesty, we spent more time on this, finding women to talk to, finding organisations who would help us um, than we did actually talking to the women. So that was a real lesson investing that time doing that detective work at the beginning uh, absolutely crucial to use local trusted organizations who were really willing to help um, but it was difficult because some of them were closed initially or they weren't doing face to face or they were just really busy but those are the organizations that that you can do your assertive outreach through because they're already in touch we did find that social media was of limited use uh, some women came to us through that, but not really the cohort we were looking for, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. And we also really believe that it's really important to say thank you, very simple, but saying thank you at the end for, for what the women gave and what the time they, they spent talking to us and what they revealed to us, and also incentivising. So we offered vouchers to everyone who took part, and I'm, and I'm sure that that helped the women come forward. And there were two approaches that worked really well. Home Start, they didn't just tweet what we were doing or put it on their website or leave flyers in people's homes. They, when they went out to people's homes, they proactively said, this is a really good piece of work. Will you speak to Wessex Voices? Can they contact you? Can we pass on your, your details? And that had a real impact. And then the other organisation that really helped was the, the Community Centre in Merstham. And once they opened in late summer, they invited us to come along. So I sat in their food project one Wednesday lunchtime, spoke to lots of women there and then volunteers there introduced me to others. So you have to have that trusted connection to, to reach out and, and get to the people you want to speak to. Next slide. So um, some early conclusions about the barriers and the enablers. We haven't written the full report up. We'd normally do it the other way around, report and then presentation, but we're doing it back to front this time. So these aren't finalised conclusions and recommendations, but just some of the things that we think are important. And first of all, I, I do think there's a real dilemma about normalising mental health. Of course, it's important to do that because then, then there's that ability to talk about it without shame. But on the other hand, I heard quite a lot about this phrase, it's just the baby blues, almost over normalising it. So it didn't get the attention that it needed. The, the next point there, I've already said it, but to reiterate it, make services about the mother. Again, some more quotes that I've put there. Um, that, that, that people said that, you know, that they believe it's all about the baby. The services are just there for the baby. It's only issue if it's about how you relate to the baby. And actually, a couple of women said to me that they thought really you only needed support where you were having bad thoughts about the baby. If it was just about your own feelings about yourself, your own well-being, it didn't matter as much. Then the next point there is about asking well and equipping everyone to have those conversations. The, we, we do it all the time in our day to day life. You know, how are you? And you don't really expect a response. And in speaking to women about their, their mental health before or after having a baby, that the way that question is phrased and the time given for a response and the prompts to make sure there's a response really, really matter. Next slide. Some more things that we learned. 
Um, I think it's really important to make sure that there's preparation in advance. So that thing about you might feel this and here's the number if you do early on in pregnancy. And remembering and acknowledging that not everybody will seek help. It's important to notice and to invite. So being told that, you know, there's a there's a support group down the road at 11 o'clock on a Wednesday morning is great. But really, the women that really need that are going to need a personal invitation, maybe even taking their. The importance of trust and building rapport that comes from continuity is a really important conclusion from this work. And finally, this question about cultural differences. Nobody, I think, is expecting everybody to know all about the different rituals within different groups. And the Asian woman who felt that her needs hadn't been met, she didn't expect the, the midwife, the, um, the health visitor, to know all of that. But she might have expected a question. Are there times when it's best for me to come and see you? Are there any things about your life that means our support for you should be a bit different? It's just asking that question. So next slide, which is almost the final, well, it is the final slide. This is just to show uh, the journey we've been on on this project. The first five uh, icons and phrases there are the work that we've done and have completed. We're now at the stage of analysing the feedback, considering the recommendations so that the changes can be made. We're yet to feed back to the women to reflect back to them what was said. Um, and we will do that once the report is produced. And I think a really, really important next stage is going back and engaging with them. They've talked to me. I've reflected it back to you today um, and their voice has been heard, but it's been heard through me and the important the messages are really important. But what I'd suggest now is that it's about going back to those women who are happy to keep on talking and work with them to make the changes. And just to reiterate that you might not recognise your services in what I've said, but this is very much their truth and, and their experiences. Some of what they said reflected really, really good practice, but I think they've brought an insight into some of the things that need to change to make sure that your services are really, really engaging everyone and the barriers are, are brought down. Thank you very much. I've no idea whether I've taken the right amount of time and I'm really happy, or Sarah and I are really happy to, to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, there's so much to think about there. I would just like to ask um, our audience if anybody's got any um, specific questions while we've still got you on the call. It's an interesting. So I, I see a lot in the yeah. chat, but I haven't been able to follow it. Um, there's an interesting comment from Vanessa Brunning about um, the perception of services that they're not there to support the mums so much and mother's well-being. So I think there is some learning there. You're right, Vanessa, around how we change perception there. Or oh, somebody has got their hand up. Abadea, hi. Hello. Good. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. It was very really interesting. Um, I'm one of the obstetrician, fetal cell medicine consultant. So my 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 main really issue is I've been kept asked how you're going to target the the um, vulnerable group, not necessarily pain, but all the vulnerable, and how you're going to re reduce inequalities in in your area of, of either the access or the outcome or from different angles. And um, I can I can address uh, the question, answer the question as that how you are going to reduce the inequality. But I really can't answer the question that how you target. Yes, you mentioned something about um, uh, starting with four areas, uh, go and find it, even Google it, uh, approach the uh, community centres and so on and so forth. Is there is there a best so that means that really targeting a very number handful numbers of women is this good enough to begin with are you happy to take that one sue yeah yeah um 
Well, any any number is is a, is a good number is is a, is a first starting point, and I do think that had we done this work outside of the the pandemic, we would have reached more women more women for this engagement exercise. Um, I I just think it is that principle of where are the women who you want to be in touch with, and and go to them. I think that that's that's the, the starting point. Um, I take your point about scale, um, but I, I, I think we would have we would have had more scale had it not been um, the, the lockdown. And and I also think it's not about just what you do. It's about what all your partners are doing as well. So working with partners, working with local trusted organisations, you, you build the scale, you build those connections. Yeah, I'm I think saying. it's really important. Um, so we're, I think we're getting a bit better now at maybe having peer support workers from the right communities that can can be that lead in for us. We, we can't just sort of march up and start knocking on doors. We we need to be sensitive about how we are, we're approaching people. And there's another hand up and I can't see who it is. Sorry, it, it's just come up um, mm. on my sort of like. Uh, Hi, Anna. Hi. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for that presentation. That was really, really interesting, really useful. I'm a substance use homeless and travellers midwife in Brighton. So all the stuff about assertive outreach is really great to see. And I, I absolutely agree. It's that that makes a difference. It's not lots of other stuff. It's time and continuity and just making that call and going round again and again and again. And I think that's the thing that makes a difference. And in Brighton, we've got some great um, outreach, assertive outreach organisations that we work with. And I think that makes a big difference. But where I really struggle, where where I see these, um, these recommendations and they're great, it's the pressure we're under as a service. I, I'm struggling just to get another seven and a half hours midwife time in my team. And I've been trying to get that for a year and I'm still I still haven't got it. Um, and I think lots of us are just really struggling. It, it takes time and, and, and to really do proper assertive outreach is really is really quite tricky. But it's great to see this. And hopefully the more the more this is formalised and evidence based, then hopefully in time it will become part of practice. Yeah, lovely. And and um, yes, you're you're probably at the sharp end there, Anna. Um, so thank you for for sharing that. I think that's that's such important insights. And we will get there. And a really good luck with you sourcing your extra hours as well. I hope that that comes to pass yeah, for you. you. That makes a difference because it is time, and women need to feel that you, women and pregnant people, need to feel that you have that time, and that you're not just going to disappear. I think because pregnancy is a time when lots of professionals come, and then lots of professionals suddenly leave. And I think yeah. we can feel very high, you know, left high and dry, really, and that's 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 challenging. Yeah, thank you for that. Thanks. Um, so I think oh. There's one more question, or is that, no, that's Anna with the hand up. That's it, legacy hand. Okay, fine. So I think um, I'm going to say a massive thank you to Sue and to Sarah for this really helpful um, project. Uh, I think um, this is going to be useful to, to lots of people in lots of different situations. So thank you so much for doing this for us. And I'm going to hand back to Liz now. Um, who is going to introduce the film for us. So back to Liz. Thank you, Jenny. So uh, Jenny and I have been nervous all morning that the technology is going to work. So everybody keep your fingers crossed that it is. Um, so I am uh, very proud to be able to um, launch the film, A Bias Trap, um, The Bias Trap, A Way Forward. We're lucky enough to be joined by, by can't get my words out. We're lucky enough to be joined by both Lorne and Charlotte, who are co-producers of the film. Um, they've both worked with us in the past on our complex PTSD film, which many of you will have watched and is available on our website. Um, and it was an absolute privilege to work with them again on this film. Um, and Lorne is also the director. So we're going to watch the film and then hopefully we will have some opportunity to um, have some questions or discussion 
um, following the film. It's um, around 26 minutes, so just to, um, you know, it's, it's quite a long film. Um, as I said earlier, if people are please able to be in the moment of watching the film, we'd really appreciate that. Um, there are also some quite hard hitting um, stories and narratives shared within the film. So um, Jenny and I would just like to say if anybody is affected by anything that they watch in the film today um, and would like to talk about it afterwards, then please do get in touch with Jenny and I for any support. Um, but although it's very hard hitting, hopefully it also shows how we are taking a way forward in order to improve, improve things going forward. Um, I have been lucky enough to see it previously, but it's so lovely to get it launched. And what I would say to everybody that watched it today is that every time they said maternity, just insert your own discipline wherever you're watching from, because this works whether you say perinatal mental health services or health visiting or IAPT or whatever um, sector you're in, all of these messages are completely transferable. I'm just going to hand over to Liz now. So thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us today and to watch the film. We would really, really welcome feedback. Um, we are making the final, final tweaks um, and then it will be up on our website and the link will be shared as well. So please, once it's um, up on the website, we would we want it to be shared far and wide. This should be used as a teaching and education educational tool. Um, I'd like to say a massive thank you to all the contributors, some of which we're lucky enough to have on the webinar in the audience today, um, others that are dotted around the country. Um, it really was a collaborative piece of work across perinatal men's health and, and maternity and, and Jenny absolutely has that right message. Although it is maternity focused, it applies to wherever you are working within health and social care. So, um, Please continue to put stuff in the chat. It's really nice. I haven't been able to read it, but I can see things coming up. Um, I don't know. We've got about five minutes left and I've got a couple of slides, but I don't know if Lorne or Charlotte wants to just come on and say anything very quickly. Who are our co-producers and Lorne is our director. Um, and apologies. Um, I appreciate that for some there was a bit of a, a lag in the um, sort of sound and um, lip movement. So apologies, it was perfect for me. So. <laughs> um, can, can you all Lord hear me? Charlotte, okay? Is there anything you would like to say? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, well, it, sorry the, the the lag, but that's, I think it's just a technical stream. So it will go and have a, have a look at it in its uh, full glory sort of thing. But uh, uh, very quickly, because I know we haven't got much time. I, I just wanted to thank you, Jenny and Liz and Barbara as well, because um you gave me the, the the freedom to really look at this from from outside you know i'm i'm a middle-aged white bloke you know making a film about uh, maternity it's been a long time since my kids were born but maternity and and racial bias so um so i sort of came from quite from a from a standpoint um that i think as a, just as a filmmaker, I just wanted to, to to tell the story, and the contributors we had were, were brilliant. They, they, it's their, you know, it's their contribution. But I didn't want it to be, and this is why I wanted to thank you. I didn't want it to be a, a PowerPoint um, film because PowerPoints have their own, you know, their their own uh, uh, sort of nuance. And I didn't want it to be literally just a sort of factual film. I wanted it to, to do what film can do, really, which is sort of you know create emotion and stir some some thoughts so I, I, that was really all i wanted was to thank you and 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 any comments that you get you guys get back from from the audience today is really welcome um you know good and bad as well anything that's missed because it's such a huge subject so i didn't know if you wanted to say anything charlotte as well i think you said it all long <laughs> that was easy for me um but yeah just to echo your thanks to everyone and um Obviously, the the people who in the, the the women, men and women in the film, thanks for them as well, and for letting us come into their busy lives and um, kind of probe them and ask the questions. And just again to reiterate what Jenny and Liz have said that when this is up on the website, um, please do share it any way that you can. We can get this out there because um, that way it's going to have a much bigger reach um, and get to as many people as possible. So thank you. 
there, there'll be a trailer actually there'll be a, yes. a i think it's a one you know 90, 100 second trailer so that's probably the way in which it will be promoted and then a link back to the film you know back to the 25 minute film so yeah we'll be using the, the trailer on lots of our different events and that so yeah Great. thank you guys lovely thank you very much i'm yeah, gonna have a go finish off with the last couple of slides. So just to remind everybody, we've only got one webinar left of this calendar year. Where is the year gone? So um, our next webinar is on Wednesday, the 15th of December. Um, we hope that you can join us then. Um, as uh, Jenny said, we're hoping to have somebody to come and speak to us from Embrace. Um, and uh, the focus will be policy and practice. The dates are up for all the webinars for next year. Um, and invites, I believe, have gone out. Somebody will tell me whether they have. If not, they're imminently about to go out. Um, and then just as always, please feel free to forward on to others. All the recordings will be made available on the website as well as all our resources. And the film um, will also be up on the website shortly. So um, without further ado, just to say thank you all for joining us and wishing you a good rest of day. Thank you very much.